Okay, we're going to start uh, with a vocabulary word I've chosen from one of the readings that you did today. So turn to page 132, paragraph 8. Read the sentence that you have there, that you find there, and then we're going to talk about empathy. And I particularly want you to think about as you read this sentence, what's the difference in empathy and sympathy. So read the sentence that you'll find on page 132 in paragraph 8 and as you're reading that you're going to tell me what the word means but you're also going to tell me how it is different from the word sympathy, S-Y, M-P-A-T-H-Y. So read the sentence uh, so underneath the pictures there on page uh, 312 paragraph 8. Oh, I put the wrong page number. I apologize. It's 312 instead of 132. 312. This is from the uh, article that you read about a solution to bullying, a very creative and unique solution, and you actually have some photographs there from uh, what they did. So everybody read that sentence and then somebody explain to me what empathy is and then how sympathy, empathy is different from sympathy. Mr. Walker. It is like being able to understand like the way someone feels. Good this yes, a very good definition. Empathy is being able to understand how someone feels. How is that different from sympathy? Oh uh, with sympathy. There's just like you feeling sorry for somebody, basically. Yeah, exactly. You're just feeling sorry for someone. So could you give me an example of how it would be different to feel empathy and how it would be different to feel sympathy? Uh, just, just use any kind of situation. I see you all waving. I'll open the door. It's warm in here. Uh, if you were in the same situation that somebody is in now, you would feel empathy for them. But like, if you haven't been in a situation, you just feel sympathy for them. Exactly, exactly. One of the things you may think about, has everybody seen on the news the migrant problem? What's happening with the people trying to flee Syria? It's easy to feel sympathy for those folks. When we see the little corpse of the three-year-old on the beach, we feel sympathy. But it may be harder to feel empathy because it's harder to place ourselves in that situation. So that's the difference here and that's what we're going to see in this article is that by putting this program in place, part of the goal was to help the students feel empathy, not just sympathy, but to feel empathy. So you want to keep that in mind uh, as we talk about that. You should have the handout gave you last time. If you don't have one, you need to come up and pick one up. And we're focusing on chapter 7, which you read for today. We're going to start with something we've been talking about all semester, the fundamental and powerful concepts whenever you're doing any kind of writing. You want to look at your handout as we talk about these. What's number one, the first fundamental and powerful concept? Don't just whisper it, say it. <laughs> What's the first fundamental and powerful concept? Purpose. Yes, it's purpose. You can say it. So this is our first of three fundamental and powerful concepts with every one that you're writing. So we're going to be looking at what your purpose is in doing this particular essay. Uh, look at your handout. Think about what you read in the chapter and you know that you're going to be proposing a solution. But then what does that mean? If you say my purpose is to propose a solution, what is the understanding that you have behind that when you say that? How do, what is a proposing a solution? What are you doing? What is your real purpose there? Giving a solution. Giving a possible 
answer to a problem. Yes, you don't propose a solution if there's no problem. You remember the old saying about when things aren't broken? Right. If something's not broken, we don't work about fixing it. So we first of all, with this kind of essay, when we're talking about proposing a solution, we need to be sure that we're dealing with a problem that needs to be fixed. So that's the most basic. Before you propose a solution, you have to make sure that there is a problem that needs fixing. And you may not have an answer that 100% uh, solves the problem, but if you can make it, it a little better, that's good enough for right now. Anything that you can do to uh, prove that there is a something that's going to make it better. But here, this can be something that can be problematic for you in writing this essay. What if people don't believe there's a problem? What are you going to have to do in the essay? You're going Right. You're going to have to persuade them that the problem exists. Now the topic that you choose is going to mean that you have a difference in how long you have to spend in your essay doing that. If it's a problem that people readily understand, readily accept, you won't have to spend much time explaining it. But if it's a problem that people don't know about, then you're going to have to give them some more information. Uh, I had a student write a problem solving. Problem solving is another way to uh, identify this essay, proposing a solution, problem solving. And he wrote about the FFA. How many of you in here know what the FFA is? One person, one person, two, two people know what the FFA is. It used to be the Future Farmers of America, but then they changed it to just the FFA because they thought that wasn't attracting people. Why would he have to explain the FFA in his essay then? The majority of people in here had no idea what it was. So if he wanted to talk about a problem in the organization, he first had to explain what the organization was, and his problem was the decreasing interest and enrollment in the program. So sometimes you're going to have to tell something you know very much about, that you have a lot of information about. You're going to have to be aware of what? What's our second fundamental and powerful concept? Audience. Audience. Yeah. Awareness of your audience. And I've given you something with your uh, audience. Look at your handout. What have I told you about your audience? Right. You don't have to address the general audience that would just be going, okay, you can imagine that you are writing to a group who can help you who can help you do whatever it is that you're going to do in this uh, essay. But even then, you may have to tell them some background. You may have to explain how big the problem is. You may have to do other things to make clear that uh, this is uh, happening and it is a real problem. What's the third fundamental and powerful concept? Right. Writing situation or genre, you can use either one. The writing situation, the genre here, is the proposing a solution in an academic essay. You will see uh, solutions often in newspapers, magazines, lots of different places. But here you're going to be doing the academic essay, which means what? What do we expect in the academic essay? What kinds of things do you expect if you are reading an academic essay? An introduction. An introduction. Body paragraphs. Body paragraphs. A conclusion, the basics, the body paragraphs, the introduction, conclusion that frame that, those body paragraphs, you expect a thesis. So all of those things are going to be true uh, in this essay. So what we're going to start with is you taking out a sheet of paper, and I'm going to give you all the same problem to write across the top of this piece of paper.
means nobody else has got to see it. This is just for you. This is just to get you started to thinking about how you think about problems. You can make a list. You can uh, do a, a cluster, a web, anything that works for you. Here is what you're going to write across the top of your paper. How can I improve my GPA? I know some of you are 4.0 students, so you may want to say, how can I keep my 4.0? But in general, most of us need, how can I improve my GPA? As always with a free write, this is part of our invention of the writing process and we are going to uh, be trying very hard not to censor anything that comes to your mind you want to write it down anytime you're doing the invention part especially when you're doing a solution being creative often is what's going to lead you to the best solution I'm going to be very short I'm going to give you two minutes and for two minutes you're going to write down everything you can think of that might help you improve your GPA begin Okay, stop. Now let's see what, very brief time, but let's see what kinds of things you came up with, possible solutions to helping you improve your uh, GPA. There's more. What, one thing that you put down that would help improve your GPA? Go to the tutor. Go to see a tutor. A very specific solution that could be done because tutoring exists. Uh, because there are various kinds of tutors. Maybe your problem is your math class. Maybe you really need to see a math tutor. So that is a possible solution that you could do right now and it's not going to cost you anything. Whenever you're talking about solutions, you have to take into account cost uh, if it's possible to do it. So we see a possible thing could be done. Uh, it would just be on the initiative of the student to do it because the program already exists. So that's one thing that could be done to improve the GPA. It's Washington. What did you uh, list? Something other than tutoring? Study hall. Study hall. Uh, is that for a specific group of people or uh, explain that to us? Oh, okay, so it's an individual study session by yourself. What would, how would that be different from what Ms. Moore said? Um, it's different than, like, you would, someone's helping you with it, but 
if you study alone, you by yourself. Okay, so with Ms. Moore's suggestion, you just have to join the program. Somebody's there to help you. Yours is requiring much more individual initiative, much more individual work uh, on your part. So would, for some students, would it make a big difference which one of those they did? Yeah, some students really need a tutor. They don't understand how to do the math problem. Other students know how to do the math problems they just need. You mentioned the library, a quiet place to study, to work on it. So that's one of the things we can see that can be different in a, a solution here. Ms. Clark, what did you mention that would improve your um, GPA? So stop procrastinating. Stop procrastinating. Don't we all <laughs> procrastinate? Okay, her solution is significantly different from the other two we heard. What is involved in to stop procrastinating? What happens if we say, I'm going to improve my GPA, I'm going to stop procrastinating? You have, there are other components to it, and first you have to manage your time. Sometimes a solution is broad, and we have to bring it down into the steps. So we can say, I'm going to stop procrastinating, and as Oliver tells us, the first thing we've got to do is manage our time. For some of us, that might mean a calendar, uh, maybe putting things on your phone or in your planner or something. So that's one thing that you can do. What would be some other steps that you could do and stop procrastinating besides managing your time? Start right away. Start right away. Tell yourself, I am going to start. Uh, this essay's first draft is due next Wednesday. You could start on it immediately. We actually have already because we, we're talking about uh, the invention and how you're going to use that. So by telling yourself, how hard is that to do? If you're already procrastinating and you tell yourself, I'm going to start on time, how hard is that? Pretty hard, yeah. So again, it might be easier to go to the tutor than it is to stop procrastinating. And some solutions that you're going to find to some problems are just not that easy. Um, if everybody has heard how many times in your life you need to eat healthy and exercise, but how many people in the United States do it? They know that's the solution, but sometimes the solution that you give is more complicated than just saying, eat better, exercise. Stop procrastinating is a wonderful objective, a solution, but then figuring out how to get there. So that might be what you have to deal with in the problem and the solution that you select, is seeing that what I am saying is hard. People aren't going to easily do this, so how can I break it down into steps? So you may need to cover that in your essay, looking at the steps to get to um, your proposal uh, here. Now we want to look at the basic features of this essay, so if you'll turn to page 299. As always, we have the, the color graphic there to help us see what the features are. You'll notice something about these four basic features that are going to make you think about the essay you've just completed. So let's look at those and see what they are. The first one, the one that's in blue, the first basic feature, a focus well-defined problem. Think back to the essay you just did. It was almost the same thing. It was a focus well-defined issue, right. Uh, so we see we're building on what you've already done. You're going to use some of the things you learned in argumentation as you build this essay. So you already have some of the foundation. We're just moving into a different direction with the skills that you have already acquired. So the focus well-defined problem, that's one of the things you're going to have to have in your essay. Think back to what we said earlier about a problem that you may need to explain your problem, more or less, depending on what the problem is. So that's what you've got to look at first, a focused, well-defined problem. The next one in the green there, what does it say? Well-argued well solution. Argued, you've learned about argumentation, so you're going to bring that, but the focus is now on the solution. One of the things that can happen in this essay is you get so involved with your problem, 
that you spend the essay talking about the problem and not really getting to the solution. The heart of the essay is going to be the solution. Certainly you have to tell us about the problem. Let us know what the problem is, but then you're going to move to the solution and well argued. You're going to think about all the things you did with argumentation and you're going to use those skills to present your solution. Uh, the next one, the peach one there. An effective response to objections and alternative solutions. In the essay you've just done, that was where some of you struggled. You had trouble doing a concession or a refutation. So we need to really focus on this one this time because it's just as important in a solution. If you have, if you're saying here's a good solution and this person over here is saying, but what about this? Be spurred to learn more and worry less. 
So here's the problem. Students are not learning, not doing as well as they should if professors just give major exams and nothing else. Is anybody in here, probably not at this level, in a class where all you have is a midterm and a final? Anybody in class? That can well be in your future where your whole grade depends on your midterm and your final. And that's the kind of class that he is talking about that you may um, encounter. And he is saying being tested more frequently gives a better view of what you know and also puts less stress on you. So those are the things that he is going to talk about uh, through here. Notice the purple, the way that he's organized um, his essay with the problem solving, proposing solution essay. You always have to start with a problem. You can't do it otherwise. You can't uh, create a solution if we don't know what your problem is. But then the way you put your solution together is lots of variables. You can determine one main solution. You can offer two or three solutions that are not big change, but some change that would affect the problem. Or you can talk about alternatives and which one is the best. So you can see that if this is simply a student saying to professors, you ought to change the way you teach your class. How effective is that going to be in convincing those professors to change their class? See lots of heads shaking. Why not? goes on as long as it does because he knows that professors are going to, some professors are going to reject the idea. So if you know that your audience is going to be, who are you telling me to do that? Or why should I listen to you? That puts the emphasis back on those argumentation things that we were talking about. Remember when you have some evidence, how do you get to your claim? You have to draw the bridge. You have to take your audience from here's some facts, here's what I say about it, and here's the connection I am making for you. Don't expect your audience to make the connection for you. You're going to make the connection for yourself. As you look through here, you will see lots of sources that are used. You will also see that he is going to concede some points, and he's going to refute some points. What is a concession? Okay, the point that the other side is right. Sometimes, remember, just as an argumentation, you have to concede something. This is true. Uh, if you're telling a professor that he or she has to change the way the course is done, what are you going to have to concede? You're going to concede that, they, that they're going to have to make a big change. Yeah. If you say you should not be giving this in midterm and final, but you should be giving more tests, you are say, you're going to have to concede it's true. A professor may have to change the way he or she's been teaching, maybe wherever. So that's a big concession to say that's true, and he does it. Now, what is the difference with a reputation? Concession, you say, the other side has a valid point, they're right. But what do you do when you do reputation? You, you, you disagree, and I love that word. You prove they're wrong. Yes, with reputation, you not only say what the other side says, but you don't concede to them. Instead, you try to prove that they are wrong. Let's look at some examples in here of where he has um, done these different things. Uh, at some points, he just gives us information. Uh, paragraph 4 on page 305. The main reasons professors should be giving for, should give frequent exams is when they do and when, the, when they provide feedback on how well they're doing, etc. 
here's a piece of evidence building his argument that this is a good solution. But he, he does that throughout the essay, but he also, um, and notice uh, he has a source, um, a study in psychological science is part of his uh, support, his evidence there, and then he makes the con connection. Uh, for that, on page 306, we see more of those, look at the colored ones, the ones that are in green. Uh, he is pointing out where he has specific evidence from specific places. Uh, in the purple in the next paragraph, this is a, a part of his transition. You're making an organizational strategy, you have to decide how you're moving to another point. And that is uh, here. Go down in that same paragraph number six to each color. It might be argued that students are adults that have to learn how to manage their own lives. And that is what the other side would say. We talked about time management uh, earlier with uh, how you do things. There's a, how many times have you all heard somebody just this semester use the word time management? <laughs> Lots of times. That is one of our expectations that as college students, you'll figure this out. When you don't have uh, somebody telling you when to get up, when to do this or that, so you have to manage your time. So that would be a major argument. If a professor tells you you're going to have a midterm and a final, then you're an adult, you work out the time. He brings that up, but then he goes on. This is one of the things he's going to refute. He's not going to concede this point. But learning history or physics is more complicated than learning to drive a car or balance a checkbook. Students need coaching and practice in learning. So it brings up the point, yes, it's true that people say this, but we're not talking about the same thing as that. We're talking about learning sometimes difficult things. Uh, if somebody's struggling in a, a course that this stuff's really hard, Maybe something right now is really hard for you. Can we, uh, as Ms. Washington said, just go to the library and study on your own all the time? Sometimes you need some help. And, and that's what he is saying here. The, if you're calculus class, if you're really struggling with that, and if your calculus teacher only gives you a mid-term final, a lot of pressure on you, and does that really teach you how to manage your time? It's his argument uh, here. He gives more of uh, page 307 at the bottom, paragraph 10. Moreover, moreover is the organizational strategy. Professors object to frequent exams because they take too much time to read and grade. It takes a lot of time to create an exam. It takes a lot of class time to do the exam. It takes a lot of time for the professor to grade the exam. So we are seeing that this is a, a confession. If the professors do this, it's going to take more than time. So how does he, uh, he concedes that it does, but what he goes on then, what does he say? There, in, uh, especially if you read over to 308, what is his point about, okay, I'm going to give you that, it's going to require more time. shorter. You don't have to give a full length exam all the time. That's one of the things. So he is proposing, he can say it's true, it's going to take more time, but here are some ways that you could do this. You don't have to use a whole class period. You can do a quiz, you could do an exam, uh, you could do these different things uh, that would make it more possible for you to uh, do these uh, changes that the professors would make. Uh, on page 307, look at the paragraph 8. Why then so, do so few professors give frequent brief exams? And what is the purpose of him including that question at that point in the essay? Why would he put it like that? Include that question at all? So he just be giving answers. Read the next paragraph. Yes, exactly. He is. Busy. 
building his argument, you can introduce a point with a question. And then you give your evidence and your reasoning for why you do that. You, you can always ask a question. And then you answer it, just be sure that if you ask a question, you need to answer it in your essay. And you can see how these uh, build then. I want you to look at the uh, references on page 309. The reference page on page 309 is the kind of reference page that you create when you do an APA style reference page. Notice that it's the, their heading is different. What do you put when we use an MLA? Word decided. Right. That's a, one of the big differences. Then you will notice that they, they always have the uh, last name first, just as an MLA. And you still that hanging indentation, make it easy to find. But then there are some significant differences that follow. Why do you think the APA style would have so much interest in a date that something is published? Whereas MLA, you put the date, but it's certainly not of that much consequence. What kinds of things would you need, what kinds of areas would you be interested in where you're very interested in the date that something was published? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. If you are, let's say that you are um, a psychologist, the things that they say, they, uh, the latest research, you want to know what the latest research is, not something that was done two years ago. So you look at the dates and you say these are the most recent. So that's why if you are told to use APA style, you're being told to use that because the date makes a difference when something was published. With MLA style, um, when you take world literature and you write a paper about poetry, we don't care if somebody one written in 1752, we don't care if you get a source from 1869 or 1969 or yesterday because the dates don't matter as much to us as the interpretation does. But if you're doing psychology, sociology, criminal justice, some of those areas, you're very interested in, I need the latest information. So that's why you will have that. And you'll see that it looks um, different there. Uh, now let's go back to your handout. I want you to read the opening paragraph. Tell me anything that you do not understand in the opening paragraph. Thank you. 
plant faith always. And the next one is something new. Why would I have given you that particular requirement that you have not had to do in any of the other essays up to this Because it's not about you. Yeah, exactly. I want you to be to take an objective stance. That is why you may not use first person in this essay. You're allowed to do that in the previous essay. But in this essay, no I, no we, no my. You have to be third person. Is that is that going to make the essay a little harder for you? Yeah, because you can't say uh, you, you can't do this kind of thing that we just talked about. I need to stop procrastinating. You have to say, students need to stop procrastinating. You're going to be looking at it more just objective. That doesn't mean that you're not going to be using first person in your proposals in the future, but very often you are going to have to use the third person. If a uh, supervisor comes to you and says, we have this problem, I need a solution to it, and you have to write it up, usually you're not going to write it up, I think that we ought to do this. Instead, you're going to say, your company is the district should, whatever your group is there. The analysis, evaluation, and synthesis, you have to analyze the problem. We, you wrote down how to improve your uh, GPA. And the first uh, answer was maybe go to a tutor. Maybe it's not that you need to go to a tutor. Maybe it's that you need to stop procrastinating. So finding the cause of the problem. Can, is this problem caused because there's not enough money to do something? Is this problem caused because somebody's not doing what he or she should be doing? So looking at some causes of the problem can uh, make a difference in what you decide is your solution. Because you've got to analyze and evaluate and you bring all of this together your synthesis to create your document. The solution, that's going to be your thesis, not the problem. Sure that the solution is your thesis. Look at the next one. To be feasible. What's it mean to be feasible? If something is feasible, it's what? If something is feasible, what is it? Okay, you're getting close. Uh -huh. Possible to do. Something that's feasible is something you can actually do. Um, you might say, um, we do this. Okay, uh, let's say Foster would be better if uh, we did a major renovation and uh, fixed all the plumbing and the electrical problems. Is that going to be feasible? Because we don't have the money. <laughs> it's more thought that mine says very funny, but that's true. If we had millions of dollars, we could fix lots of problems. You have to decide if there's money involved, where is it going to come from? Uh, do you all want to pay twice as much money to live in the dormitory to get those problems fixed? No, if not, then maybe you've got to come up with some other kind of solution. But it has to be feasible. It has to be something you can actually do. I want you to look at the bottom because this essay is a little different from the ones that you've done before in the way you organize it. You can choose either one of these structures. It depends on what your proposal is going to be. If you want to say, uh, and you look at the example, the student essay I put on Blackboard, um, that is an example of the alternative solutions written by a uh, student here. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's written about the night complex, about West uh, and the fire alarms. If you look at that one, you'll see another example. She used, they used the alternative example, the second one. The best example would be this one because even though this one sounds good, it costs too much. So we have to go to this one. So either one of those structures can work for you. On the uh, back side of the uh, handout, you do not have to use any of these topics. What I was trying to do was get you to narrow down. Uh, as I said, the one that I, I see students struggle when they try to take on too big a problem. So 
So I suggested some smaller problems that you might be interested in. I, I just put ones that are connected to the campus. Yours does not have to be connected to the campus, but you do need to have something that can be dealt with in the uh, in the essay that you're writing. Don't try to cover solving pollution. You could cover littering on campus, something like that. So narrow it down to something that you can actually work with. Okay, so as you look over the handout, are there any other questions? When is the first draft of this paper due? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right. So you should be in the invention process now. If you have not completed your learning curve or launch pad uh, solo activity online, it is due. So if you've not completed, I know many of you have already done it, but it's great. But if you've not done it, it will close 1159. So uh, make sure that if you've not done that, you do that. Um, any questions?